we are back with another fantastic talk, this time from Harry Mendel, who is data architecture at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, fun fact about Harry that I just learned is that he once worked for Stevie Wonder, and he also invented digital sampling. So get ready for a fantastic talk from somebody with a, a very colorful past. He's going to be talking today about compliance program enhancements using artificial intelligence, natural language processing with Lex. So take it away, Harry. Thank you about today. Uh, is something we call Lex, and basically a large part of what the Federal Reserve does is, uh, especially since the financial crisis, is monitor banks, particularly the banks which are too large to fail, as well as smaller uh, banks and foreign banks. So one thing I have to say before I continue is everything I say today is just reflects my own beliefs and not those of the Federal Reserve. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so, this involves on site examinations where we send a team of, of auditors to the various banks. It involves all types of, we have something called enforcement action where we say you're not doing this thing according to the specs. It is so long to fix it and we monitor it. And anything which may be causing uh, worries or risks to the financial system. Uh, because of the volume of documents, we, we get, we collect probably close to half a million documents per year, and these documents can be rather large. This is just talking about our checking to make sure the banks are doing what they need to do for money laundering. So we go in, we check the procedures, but, and it turns out that uh, this was the first area we wanted to see if uh, using natural language processing could help the examiners go through all these documents and identify things that may be of interest to them. So we set up uh, an experiment where we had the same reports go to our system as and to a bank examiner group. And we also had people work together with us from supervision to come up with setting up rules to identify this. So we used two, uh, a combination of two areas from that. We used sort of the old fashioned rules where we would say we want to find certain things and we would list them. They need this so they can do attribution and auditing. But also we wanted to make use of word embedding because without word embedding, for those of you that haven't heard of this before. It's a way that you can uh, put a word into uh, a vector space, and that's a mathematical term, but basically into, you can picture it into a group of words which have similar meanings. And you can take the distance between them, and I'll show you some representations of that later. But this way, you don't have to worry about keywords. You can just express a concept, and it will match that concept in the document. So, for example, one of the areas which we're concerned with now is climate change and risks to banks. So if we put just the word anthropogenic into our system, so you can see which words and phrases come back, and all these would be identified by that. So everything from greenhouse warming to atmospheric CO2 to terrestrial ecosystems, climate variations, global warming, greenhouse gas, and so on. Would be, rep would be matched by any of these words. So if the examiner says, I want to look for atmospheric CO2, everything else on this chart and more would be picked up. So one of the things that happens if you do this is you get back too many matches and you can get noise. So we designed a system um, that has something that's called a lexicon, which we'll explain later. This shows what a submission looks like. So if you want to look at that and read it while I'm describing uh, the way the lexicon works, even though they're unrelated, it will save a little bit of time because we've got a lot to go through. But you can see when we get these packages, they have Excel sheets attached, Word documents, a lot of things. So we have to go through all this and, and scan it all. Um, so 
avoid the noise, we put logical uh, conditions. So we might say something like global warming, and then we'd have an add to that, financial risk or volatility or loss. So we wouldn't pick up things unless it matched both the ecological effects as well as the financial effects. So uh, one of the things that happened is that this experiment worked out very well. And about the same time as we were uh, completing the success, what I call our success with money laundering uh, detection and bank compliance, the pandemic hit. And this changed the way we could do our monitoring. We no longer could do on-site examinations, but we were still responsible for continuous monitoring. So it started out as a proof of concept and a gentle rollout became a uh, pedal to the metal uh, acceleration to put this into full production. Because every area, and we did the top 10, and now we have 30 of compliance that we look at, we're now put through Lex and all the continuous monitoring and financial analysis of the banks were greatly enhanced by having this tool. And uh, it was through the cooperation of both technology, supervision, and many people, I think there's probably over 100 people working on this now, that enabled such a rapid scale up. This is basically a, a 30,000 foot view of how it works. And the preprocessor takes all these documents in all these different forms and converts them into a common format that, that's coded in, in something called JSON, which is a way of representing uh, unstructured data in a somewhat structured way. Uh, you've heard of NoSQL databases and so on. that They work under similar principles. It essentially has keys and values, and the sentences are identified. And they're then, uh, and also at the same time, I'll tell you a funny, a funny aside which affected the architecture. Not everyone at the Fed is used to using uh, computer-based uh, search tools, and a lot of them like to read documents on a computer, but they're still reading a PDF document. So they said, by the way, would it be possible for you to do what our readers did before, which was they had different stages, and the first group of readers read the documents, and then they highlighted the parts they thought would be interesting to their managers, and they would pass that. Can your computer highlight the documents too? Now they thought this was a simple request, but actually uh, it was one of the harder parts of the design because the PDF documents and Excel and all these things had various formats, and we had to keep track of the exact location and all the documents, these phrases. So we had to have a data structure which not only stored the sentences and the data that we were extracting, but page 37, uh, character number 300, whatever, to identify the highlighting. <coughs> and they would be very upset if we highlighted anything that we weren't supposed to. So, and you can see there's a, in the corner, there's what the document outputs looks like. And you can see that it's highlights and they were put in by Lex. So after this whole thing is prepared and put in this JSON format, it then goes into what we call the Lex engine. In the beginning, we called it the NLP engine. They rebranded it. And what it does is it goes through all these rules and looks for the combination of words that match according to the similarity model. And one of the other things we discovered right away is we were using a open source word embedding model that was released by Google around that time. And it didn't have a lot of the words we needed because financial documents with acronyms and are also specialized or just different meanings of the word. Uh, in fact, uh, one, of, one of the banks um, had the word, we were looking for things that had to do with loans and they, and they had put pawn in one of their lexicons and it came back with a chess move. <laughs> what is this? And uh, so we realized we had to make our own model. And we, we after, uh, a lot of negotiating, we were given permission 
to uh, create our own uh, words of ec model based on all the documents they have in their corpus. And this had another advantage besides bringing it up to speed with all the vocabulary. It also let us see when the vocabulary was being introduced, which so we, we train this on a monthly basis, and that shows new areas of concern for the bank. So it's one way of detecting like what people are thinking about before we ask the questions, because we get this new generated vocabulary list. And then we say, does this belong in some of your lexicons? People say, yeah, we should do that. And it, it does one of the things which people ask for and almost never get, which is to discover unknown unknowns. So that's just an advantage of uh, continuously training or training on a periodic basis. Uh, so this is just to talk a little bit more about the very basics of, of word of act. I wish I had time to go through the algorithm because it's, it's very elegant the way it works. But you may have heard uh, there's a distinction between supervised and unsupervised learning, where supervised learning is where you have an answer to compare to, and unsupervised is where you don't. And this actually makes use of something uh, that some people refer to as unsupervised supervised learning, which sounds a bit like an oxymoron. But they discovered that if you mask a word in a sentence and have the computer try to guess what it is, or if you want to do generative text, you want to see what the next word might be. So you maybe leave out the last word in a sentence. And you try to guess. You've now created a supervised problem because you've masked out something. And then at the same time that you mask it, you know what the answer is. And you can put that in the column that says target. And by using a neural net to solve for this, you can take the last layer of the network and that uh, is the vector that represents the word that it was trying to guess after it finally learns. And that's what creates the word embedding that we then put in the 300 dimensional space that makes this magic happen. Now, I hope you can read this. Is it legible? So this is produced by a technique called TISNY, which allows you to focus in on a little bit of the model. And even though it's a three-dimensional data structure, it reduces it to two dimensions. So you can see basically how these relationships work in terms of distance. So if you look at where the capital adequacy, which was what it was centered on, you can see that capital planning and stress test is right nearby. Uh, that stress testing, capital planning, recovery, resolution planning, and all the things that would make sense to someone looking at the capital adequacy are represented there. Uh, similarly, if you look at CCAR, which is at the top, which is one of the things that we require banks to do, which is a stress test, there's a similar one called DFAST. And, and if you look around that, you see the terms which have to do with those things. So imagine when you're searching for something, you don't have to be that precise. You just have to get somewhere in the neighborhood of what you're interested in. And this algorithm will find it. And it looks pretty good in two dimensions. It's that much better in 300 dimensions even though it's hard to visualize, impossible. So again, this talks about the difference between creating your own do domain model versus using an open source model. We uh, had a 20% increase in the number of relevant words. And that's important, because if you're missing a fifth of the words that are important to you, you're in trouble. And we have a total vocabulary of uh, now 3.6 million words. And both of these uh, concepts were not in the Google model, and many ones weren't. So if you put in capital adequacy, it would just come back without a vocabulary. But with the trained model, you get things like capital planning, adequacy, poor stress, capital ratios, and other things which you would be interested in. Now, the structure of the lexicon, we can't show much of these because it's uh, proprietary information, but just to give a, a little bit of a look, you have different columns, and you can have as many columns as you want. And essentially, the columns show a relationship where everything must be present. So if you have two columns, it's an and between the first and second column. So in this case, you would have to have something 
which related to money laundering or, or the abbreviation AML, which is also commonly used. And then also has something in the sentence which relates to it being suspicious or activity or a violation or a concern. And each one of these words will be put into the model and expanded. And it casts a, a but wide but sort of specific and targeted net. The, uh, the Boolean combination of these terms reduces the noise. And so you get the depth where you want it without getting things that you wouldn't want to receive. So this is the process we went through to validate it because just because it works doesn't mean that it's working correctly. So you have to validate. And this is where we cycled through these you know, review analysis and action over and over again, having people write the lexicons, comparing it to a control group, which went through the documents the way they used to, and then seeing what was in common. And we, we did over 80% of what the... Uh, people did, and then we found things that they didn't find. And actually, some of the things that we didn't find, they didn't think, find, think were that important. So they were very happy with it, and it reduces the time for uh, just one area and one bank from several weeks to less than a day. So we did. This is a more complex lexicon. Typical lexicons are about 38 lines and have between two and three columns. And the type of trigger is also recorded. So you can later do database analysis of what types of violations and what types of uh, enforcement actions or other things of interest are coming up per bank. And you can make a time series of that. We have a dashboard which shows, uh, in this case, the relative number of uh, fines that were for a particular query by bank. And in this case, we're looking for uh, cloud adaptation, uh, staying within budgets and overall strategy issues. And below that is a time series. Uh, we are improving this. Part of the peaks are based on quarterly filing dates. So it's a bit distorted. But now we're trying to get more accurate uh, date sources by going back to actual dates picked up off the documents rather than the dates we received and smooth that out. And Again, this is uh, where you can sort by various things, like how, ma how many fines, what particular fines, what triggers you're looking for. Go to the document, push the button, then see the document. Those are the, not only do we have the highlights in yellow, but we also create a, an index which directly links to the sections that you'd be interested in. And this is what the highlighted output looks like. We also store the same JSON output uh, into a database which allows Tableau integration. And this way, you can look at all the different triggers that are used in the lexicons, as well as the attributes, which is the second column. They're logically the same, but people think of them differently. And then you can see which reports come up, and then you can drill down. You can eliminate. You can say, I want it with this trigger, this trigger, but not that trigger, and make more complex on the fly uh, Boolean relationships. And finally, we have a sandbox for authoring. So when people create the lexicon, they often want to know what effect this word will have, what effect that word will have. They can put in their own test documents and try it out, and it helps them understand how the model works, and how the search works, and gain a facility. Because one of the things we ended up having a shortage of right away were lexicon writers. And uh, we helped them a lot in the beginning. Then we had classes where we taught them how to create lexicons. And now we have over 30 different risk areas modeled through this process. And this is just more graphics showing how it works. They can type in the, the words. They can read in a document and see what comes back. In this case, it gives the matches that came back. So they also, well, actually in this case, they're just understanding how the model works. So they would type in a word like backlog, and then it would, it would set a threshold, and then it would come back and show uh, what words would match that, which again helped them in the creation of the, of the lexicons. And these are some of the use cases with climate risk. The pandemic uh, was a very important one because we're also monitoring how the funds 
uh, were being spent, uh, that were being provided by the banks for pandemic relief, as well as what risks were created to the banks, the financial systems, and uh, climate risk was also called for a lot, and that was one of the next ones to put into production. And that concludes my talk. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I, I, there's really uh, it could be a, it could be applied to that. If someone has a, that kind of use case and were to approach us, we would talk about. It. Yes. Yes, we, we read Excel, we read Word, we read well, almost any document can be converted. We also read PDF, so anything that can be printed, we can read. Okay. Yeah, we can. In fact, it can be also used for, for other applications such as security logs or other types of logs that are recorded in, in data centers. I mean, there's really no, there's no limitation to that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of interest uh, throughout the Federal Reserve System, and one of the things which we would like to do, and it's under discussion, is to make it available uh, in a uh, easily accessed API, so that anyone on the system. Could use it right now. People can use it, but there's a more lengthy onboarding process, mostly because of security concerns. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you.